to eat. Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Tensions are rising in East Asia between two of Asia's great powers, Japan and China, and also, as we can see in today's news, Taiwan. Detention is focused on the Senkaku, or Dalyutai Islands, which are under the control of Japan, but claimed by China and uh, Taiwan. Our guest today is Dr. Yoichiro Sato, Director of International Strategic Studies at Ritsumeikon Asia Pacific University. He has just written a very interesting uh, packnet, a newsletter, for Pacific Forum, our friends down the street here in downtown Honolulu, uh, called The Senkaku Dispute and the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. In addition, just last week, he gave a very interesting presentation uh, at the University of Hawaii about uh, three island issues uh, confronting Japan. The Senkakus, or Dalyus, uh, Takashima, or Dokdo, if you, uh, uh, depending on what side of uh, the issue you are, and also the Kuro Islands. Um, maybe just to orient ourselves here, we should get an idea of uh, what we're doing here, or where we're going to talk about. And can we get a close up on this one? You can see the red dot here uh, indicates the Dalyu Islands. The other red X is uh, Dokdo Islands, uh, or Takeshima, and the Kuros are up here. Uh, if we look at this map of Korea, we can probably get a better view of just where Takeshima Dokdo is. Um, this is a really, really timely story we have for you today because just this morning, Japanese Coast Guard vessels and Taiwan Coast Guard vessels were facing off each other in the immediate vicinity of the Dalyu and Kaku Islands, spraying water at each other. And we certainly hope that this situation, um, uh, the tensions lessen, but we, uh, we, we think we've got a really good show for you today. Dr. Sato has been with us many times, and we welcome him back to Asian Review. Thank you. Oh, wow, where do we start? Uh, can you give us a brief history of the Senkaku Dalyu uh, question? Sure, yeah. Well, how far do you want me to go back? Well, just, uh, <laughs> no, actually, yeah. I don't want to go too far. You don't want to go back too far. Just give us an <laughs> Everything idea. Everything is really fuzzy. <laughs> it is fuzzy. Yeah. Maybe just a very brief summary of the relative claims. Yeah. Well, the island seems to have been used by uh, people in the area for various reasons, sometimes for navigational purposes, sometimes for taking uh, refugee from storms in the East China Sea. You know, today, you know, I just saw uh, big typhoons you know, heading in that direction and so forth. So, uh, you know, Okinawans, Taiwanese, Chinese, and maybe Japanese, you know, they all uh, well, one way or one another using that island at some point in history. But uh, the territorial ownership, you know, in the international legal sense, you know, requires certain things, and you, you have to uh, claim it legally and get it recognized by other countries in the international community, and it has to be documented, it has to be continuously uh, administered. So uh, just finding a place first but not doing anything afterward, or that sort of uh, uh, situation, does not automatically result in, uh, in you know, legal possession mm. of mm. that island. Mm. It, in a sense, similar to you know holding a title to a piece of property on the ground, mm -hmm. and, you know you might have the rights to it, but you know if you don't administer it, if you don't manage it, and you know somebody just occupies a piece of land for a certain period of time, you may lose it. Mm. So, uh, so that kind of similar to uh, international law situation. Mm. And going back to the history, the legal, uh, internationally recognized legal claim dates back to uh, 1895 uh, when Japan was uh, uh, coming out of this uh, Sino Japanese war. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't done in the uh, Shimonoseki Treaty, which 
ended the war technically, but mm -hmm. before that, Japan, uh, or Japanese government, did its own uh, research and made a determination that the, the island had no owner. Mm. And uh, then Japan uh, uh, claimed ownership mm. of this island, and uh, that uh, claim was recognized by other major powers. Uh, Wh which major powers? Uh, the European countries. European countries. Yeah, United States? And, uh, the United States, I don't think it had the recognition, because if it did, it cannot claim that uh, it has no position on the sovereignty mm, issue I at see. this time. I see. Basically, if I recall correctly, the, the Japanese claim is basically based on this notion of, well, nobody was living there, it was a no man's land, so right. therefore we, we're claiming it. Right. What the Chinese side said, well, back in history from what, I can't remember exactly when they start to say their claim is valued, but it, far back in history. Right. Um, so you know there are some you know uh, claims claim documents mm -hmm. which uh, uh, allegedly support the Chinese claim, mm -hmm. and uh, you know historians are debating those things. Right. And uh, there are some controversies surrounding right. what the Chinese call evidence, but uh, but nonetheless, uh, none of them. None of those Chinese claims <coughs> have been tested on the international legal ground simply because, you know, although the Japan is the one currently administering the island, China has not brought the case to the International Court of Justice. Mm. And Why? this is very interesting because usually the country in dispute, which doesn't have the administrative control mm -hmm. would go to International Court of Justice even knowing that the other party wouldn't accept the international uh, uh, jurisdiction over the particular case. Well, that's particularly true in the Dr. Takashima case. But why is it that the, um, why is it that China doesn't want to go to the uh, International Court? Well. I can tell one reason uh, is definitely not the case mm -hmm. that China doesn't want to offend Japan. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody would agree with that. <laughs> that is definitely not the case. <laughs> definitely not the case. Yeah. Okay. So then why? Right. Is it because China is afraid of losing the case and embarrassing itself? Or what? I, I, my guess is that China is afraid that if it takes the case to the international court, Japan wins. All those claimants in the South China Sea will follow the same path, and China mm. might lose more. Mm. That's possible. No. Uh, maybe for our viewers, I should just hold this up. Uh, this is a very colorful brochure put together by the Taiwan government. Uh, of course, they have a very strong interest in the Dalyu Islands. President Ma himself has long been associated with this issue. Uh, speaking with people in Washington today, uh, and, and one person in, the, uh, in particular who just talked to President Ma 12 days ago uh, tells me that, you know, President Ma has an extremely encyclopedic knowledge about this issue. This brochure, it's not only very colorful, but also cites a lot of documents uh, that, um, you know, support the Taiwan uh, position, and I think it's probably fair to say from that the Chinese position. Um, uh, so governments are in the area, China, Taiwan, Japan are extremely interested in this issue. It's a very emotional issue. Um, you know, the thing, though, that, that strikes me uh, I watch a lot of Chinese television at home, and they were talking about this issue, um, uh, and also watch a lot of NHK uh, over the weekend, and say, well, when China and Japan went to reestablish relations in 1972, mm -hmm. this issue came up, and Joe and Lai would say, well, let's just forget it. Let's just forget it. Let's put this to the side. Let's, this, is mm -hmm. a, this is a non-issue. There are mm -hmm. more important things to think about. Mm -hmm. 
I know that in the early 50s, there was a Chinese um, classified document that somehow got leaked. Mm -hmm. And it said that these islands belong to Japan. Mm -hmm. And there's all these little yeah. pieces of evidence that come up. Right. Um, it seems that neither party was really too concerned about these islands until they realized there were tremendous natural resources underneath them in the immediate area. And not, not just only fish. I know that well, there is rich in skipjack, tuna, bonito, mm -hmm. mackerel, and a couple other kinds of fish, whose types I forget. Well, the resource potential, I mean, people knew about the fish a long time. The but, fish uh, is well established. Yeah, the discovery of uh, well, some potential <laughs> oil deposit right. and, and gas deposit in the area in the uh, uh, late 1960s mm. clearly uh, had some role in the escalation of the dispute. But nonetheless, I would argue that the resource is actually a small part of this dispute. And the way dispute escalated it has more to do with the broader uh, diplomacy. And uh, also, it, the issue developed in a, in a way the neither government uh, quite anticipated. Mm. And a lot of things happened in between. Mm. And first of all, the, both Chinese mm. government and the Japanese government were uh, willing to kind of, you know, uh, de-emphasize these territorial issues uh, for the sake of a stronger strategic partnership between mm -hmm. China, Japan, and also the United States mm -hmm. against the Soviet Union mm -hmm. during the, the Cold War period. Mm -hmm. So uh, when the U.S. and Japan started, you know, improving relations with China in the early 1970s, three parties were all, you know, interested in keeping this issue a low-profile issue. Mm. But uh, then in 1978, when uh, Japan switched the diplomatic recognition from uh, Taipei to Beijing, the Taipei government was upset mm. of this shift, mm. and me, clearly uh, the Taipei, you know, didn't want to be, you know, just thrown out of. You Th know. That was 1972, right? The peace treaty was 1978. The reestablishment the peace, of relations was peace, peace treaty. Yeah, the diplomatic relation. I mean, diplomatic recognition didn't change until 78. Mm. Although Japan. Uh, 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 had a rapprochement with the uh, Beijing government. Mm, mm. So, uh, and same with the United States. Right, yeah. right. So, uh, at that point, the Taiwanese got upset. And that's when the Senkaku dispute escalated between Japan and Taiwan. Mm. So, we you know, tend to think that this is an issue between Japan and the People's Republic of China, mm -hmm. Beijing. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, uh, it's also an issue of competition between Beijing and Taipei. Ah, I agree with that, yeah. And uh, you, my colleague, uh, Dr. Chin Chen Chan, mm -hmm. at the Ritsumekan Asia Pacific University, mm -hmm. he is uh, currently doing a research on this very subject. Mm. And uh, he, he can tell you more about the origin of this uh, Beijing Taipei competition over the Senkaku Island. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So this is a kind of legitimacy competition between the two governments mm. claiming to represent China and fighting uh, anti colonial war mm. against mm. Japan. Mm. So these aspects cannot be ignored when you talk about the Senkaku dispute. Right. There's a lot of um, Certainly, a lot of nationalism involved here, and a sure. lot of symbolism. Right. Um, do the Senkakus have strategic value to Japan? Strategic meaning military value. In a military sense. I don't think 
that is important. Mm. I think it's more important legally mm. uh, in terms of Japan's uh, international legal strategy mm. and also for China as well. Mm. The Senkaku is very significant. When you say that, you mean the resolution of the Kuro Island issue, mm -hmm. the, perhaps the resolution of the Takeshima Do Dokdo uh, issue, and for China, no. how this issue comes out would impact their negotiations in the South China Sea? Well, no, the Japan's dispute with Korea over the Takeshima Dokdo or the Kuril Island with Russia mm. Uh, two different cases, very different backgrounds, very different current situation, mm -hmm. and very different uh, international legal uh, relevance. Okay. The Senkaku's uniqueness is it's very much tied to the extended continental shelf claims okay. Okay. of both China and Japan. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. So, you know, this is particularly important because China, you know, has uh, submitted uh, the extended continental shelf claim, which stretches all the way to the Ryukyu Trough, right. which is uh, a little deeper uh, water, northwest of uh, the Okinawan chain of islands. Right. And uh, China said all ocean floors and everything underneath up to that line belongs to China. Mm. Whereas Japan's saying, no, 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 you know, Japan is on the, basically the same continental shelf. Mm. So uh, it's only fair to draw the line in the middle. Mm. Mm. So their claimed maritime border are disagreeing. And the problem about the Senkaku is Senkaku Islands are located inside China's claimed line mm. on the very continental shelf which China claims as China's. Right, right. So uh, this is very pro problematic for China's legal claim. Mm. And for Japan, this is like a second line of legal defense because even if China loses, it, I mean, even if Japan loses its the international legal arg argument that the border should be the middle line, Japan can still claim that, well, we still have those islands over there, mm. so we can claim uh, <coughs> some, you know, e exclusive economic zones mm. or continental shelf claim. Mm. So uh, for both countries, the control of the Senkaku and legal ownership of the Senkaku very much affect their claims to the much broader area of ocean floor. Mm. Mm. Um, I was watching this Chinese TV show on Sunday. It's a very lively talk show. And of course, since this issue is so much in the news with dem you know, big demonstrations going on in several parts of China, and there have been a few demonstrations in Japan, much quieter than those in China. Um, this one Chinese commentator was saying, well, there is a resolution to this. Uh, I'm wondering how you could respond to this. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan gives up the Senkakus, mm -hmm. and we drop our claim to Okinawa. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, ignoring international law to that extent is just outrageous, I must say. And, you know, I mean, China has already claimed that, you know, its continental shelf claim stretched all the way to the Rikyu Trough, mm -hmm. but China's not claiming the Okinawans, mm. right? Okinawan Islands. So at that point, China is already, you know, admitting, you know, implicitly that Okinawa is part of Japan. So then how can China claim that it's claiming Okinawa and that claim can be dropped? I mean, th that's nonsense. <laughs> I, I've heard this the Chinese, uh, a few Chinese commentators uh, suggest that Okinawa really belongs to, uh, mm -hmm. to China. Mm -hmm. I personally find that hard to accept. Yeah. 
Um, well, in your PACnet, if I recall correctly, <coughs> you were saying that the United States should really sort of uh, take a more dynamic um, diplomatic stand mm -hmm. on the Senkakus. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, what I was arguing in the Parknet piece is that uh, there's a perception in Japan that uh, the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance would not apply to the Senkaku once Japan loses its administrative control over the island. Mm. So this doesn't make a uh, uh, good sense because you know, although Japan is primarily responsible for its own territorial defense, mm -hmm. the alliance is not only for deterring any kind of attack against Japanese territorial space, mm. but if necessary, to retake it. Mm. And I mean, if you understand the alliance to mean it's only for deterrence and once part of the territory is lost, alliance wouldn't apply. That's nonsense. Mm. But nonetheless, there is a perception in Japan that uh, that might be the case, and the U.S. is deliberately being uh, uh, vague mm. on its commitment to the Senkakus. Mm. So, uh, you know, Japanese uh, diplomats and uh, political leaders, more importantly, they are trying to get uh, a more explicit uh, verbal commitment from the United States. And the U.S. position is it takes no position on the question of sovereignty right. over the Senkaku Islands. And nevertheless, the U.S. recognizes the present administrative control right. of Japan. Right. So this is a very uh, uh, complex position, to mm -hmm. say the least. Mm -hmm. And it does invite misinterpretation. Mm. And well, it's a, not too big of a problem as long as only the Japanese are you know, puzzled by this statement mm -hmm. and worried some extra bit. Mm -hmm. But it is a problem if China misinterprets this, pr this mm. uh, statement and thinks that China can quickly take the island mm -hmm. and create a new status quo. Yeah, yeah. Because that, that misinterpretation is actually inviting Chinese aggression. Some of the comments I heard on this Chinese TV show on Sunday were pretty disturbing. Well, let's just send missiles there. You know, China's very proud of its second artillery, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I suppose you would call those the strategic rocket forces like the Soviet, the then Soviet Union had. And they're saying, we'll turn those loose or even use atom bombs or uh, some, of the, some of the comments, pretty 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 scary yeah mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and one only has to look at the the intensity of the the demonstrations in China I think to be really concerned yeah. um, now in your packet you also said the Taiwan factored into this mm -hmm. and I think if I recall correctly you were saying the United States should make some special concessions to Taiwan to get it to I don't know, back off on its claims to Dalyu, to the Dalyu Islands? Right, yeah. The, although Taiwan and Beijing are all, both claimant mm -hmm. to the Senkaku Island, the Taiwan's claim should be treated differently from the Beijing's claim. In which respect? Yeah. Well, the Beijing needs to be militarily deterred, mm -hmm. and the clear me message mm -hmm should be sent, and I believe it has been sent during the uh, recent U.S. visit, uh, the Defense Secretary uh, Leon Panetta's What, what was the message? Uh, meeting. Well, that, uh, the message, as reported, is that the, the treaty, U.S.-Japan treaty, applies to the Senkaku Islands. Yeah. And, uh, but I don't know with what the exact wording was. Mm. But uh, I mean, since that visit, the Chinese uh, behavior 
uh, around the Senkaku Island is on the kind of coming down slope. I had the feeling today that um, actually the mainland behavior of all three parties was probably the most responsible. I mean, they had six vessels there from the uh, maritime, what do they call that, Mar maritime surveillance, surveillance force. Four of them with, were recalled to China. Mm -hmm. Two of them were in the area but outside of contested waters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think you've got something there. And, and I think that, that China knows that it still lacks the military ability to tangle with the United States. Mm -hmm. And clearly the Japanese Navy is right. one of the very best in the world. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, China has made its point by, you know, sending some of those, I, I believe it was two ships, uh, that briefly violated the territorial mm -hmm. water, mm -hmm. but quickly withdrawn mm -hmm. to the, the contiguous areas. Right. And now the, some of the ships are returning home. Right. So uh, I think China is trying to uh, kind of calm down for right. now. Right. And I heard very interesting thing from uh, one of the uh, audience mm. when they gave a talk at the UH. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this Chinese uh, man was saying that uh, he watches a lot of the Chinese news, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and he said that uh, one of the commentaries he saw on the Chinese media was basically saying that uh, if you, if China and Japan continue to, uh, you know, fight and have deteriorating relations over the Senkaku Islands, the only winner out of that will be the United States, who can play one country against the other. Mm. And mm. he was asking, is this true or not? And But rather than uh, answering whether it's true or not, which is an unanswerable question, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I was interested because uh, the fact that Chinese media let that kind of view reach the public shows me that the China is actually interested in putting the issue down mm. and keep keep it low profile again. Mm. And because I mean, China, after escalating the situation this much. China need a reason to calm it down, right. and the U.S. was made a scapegoat, mm. scapegoat for that. That's mm. my reading of that kind of uh, reporting mm. in China. So this member of the audience actually got that view from the Chinese press yeah. and passed it on. Right, right. Mm. Well, certainly both countries would suffer economically. Well, if, that's for sure. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Now, okay. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. If the United States takes a more um, assertive stand on the Senkakus, um, what kind of quid pro quo might it expect from Japan? A sort of um, a, a, an easier going attitude on Futemba and Okinawa or other <laughs> basing <laughs> issues? Or, Less animosity about the offspring. <laughs> uh. Well, I mean, you can surely expect better cooperation from the central government, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that uh, you know local governments in Japan would, you know, support mm -hmm. the national government policies without a question. Right, right. So, right. Uh, so. The, the Osprey and Hutema issue will continue to be difficult. Mm. Yeah. It's a great issue for politicians to run on. Uh, yeah. Governor of Okinawa or yeah. mayor of whatever city, it's, yeah. it's, it's an issue that's, that's going to yeah. work with a lot of people. Yeah. But the, the, the U.S. You know, should realize that uh, instead of expecting something in return for closer commitment mm -hmm. to the Senkaku, mm -hmm. Coming out more explicitly on the Senkaku actually saves the U.S. from later having a possible trouble 
<coughs> of having to respond mm, to the true. Chinese occupied Senkaku. I, it, I think it also builds U.S. credibility in Asia. And credibility, every yeah. Asian country is always worried about the U.S. leaving. It, yes. just, it doesn't matter which country it is, it, yeah. uh, uh, that comes up all the time. Yeah, I mean, U.S. cannot uh, risk its alliance credibility with its many other partners. Right, right. And if this pivot is really to work, it, it uh, absolutely needs those. Right. Um, mm. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting points that you're bringing up. Um, I heard an interesting point. Um, it went like this. Depending how the United States deals with the Senkaku issue, and maybe this is saying the same thing you're saying, but in a slightly different way. Depending how well the United States deals with the Senkaku issue, it will have a, have a uh, large impact on the future position of the United States in Asia. Hmm. That if it doesn't handle this situation well, uh, it will be to China's advantage. Uh, and I infer by this that it will create um, some division in the U.S.-Japanese uh, security mm. relationship, and as a result of that, it will undermine the U.S. position in East Asia. Sure, definitely. I mean, if U.S. Uh, uh, takes a kind of uh, having China on one hand, Japan on the other, and try to play one against the other mm -hmm. over the Senkaku issues, mm -hmm the U.S. will lose the credibility of its alliance with Japan, mm. and, and Japanese will feel threatened mm -hmm. and vulnerable, mm -hmm. and that will invite a lot of uncertainties mm -hmm. in the future international relations in the region. If the U.S. plays too neutral of a position, that also could hurt it in the long term. Yes. So it, it's interesting when people say, oh, they're just a group of little rocks out there in the ocean. They're, they're, these are much more than rocks. Yeah, I mean, that's a common perception, but uh, the, a lot of people have that perception because mm -hmm. they don't know about the, the relevance of these islands to the much bigger the disputes right. over the continental shelf claims right. between Japan and China. I, and these could very well, if the U.S. doesn't handle this right, it could very well undermine its position in Asia. Very much so. A, a position where it should spend a lot of time, money, effort, and blood in trying to build yeah. for some time. Yeah. Mm, not to mention the economic benefits that the United States hopes to reap from this uh, pivot towards Asia. Right. Mm. In your view, is the United States trying to contain China? Militarily? Mm -hmm. uh, Strategically, I, militarily? Well, I think U.S. policy is kind of twofold. Mm -hmm. You know, the China is a growing economy, mm -hmm. so, you know, engagement of China economically mm -hmm. is of mutual benefit, mm -hmm. both China and the United States. Mm -hmm. and, and Japan is on the same boat in that sense. Mm -hmm. Japan-China economic relations have been, you know, booming until well, that's true. very no recently. That. So, uh, but at the same time, the growing China is spending a lot on its military, mm -hmm. modernizing its navy, mm -hmm. and, you know, having an ambition to have a strong blue water navy. Right. You know, the Chinese aircraft carrier was just transferred to right. the military. Right. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. finished the, you know, testing, practicing period. And, so, uh, so militarily, both Japan and the U.S. are preparing for a possible containment policy mm. if that becomes necessary. Yeah. I, I have to admit, you know, um, the U.S., of course, says, well, no, we're not trying to contain uh, Asia. We're just trying to get it to be a responsible member of the international community. Sure, yeah. 
But then, you know, I can't help but think there is something to the Chinese view when you see the United States sort of ginning up all these security relationships mm -hmm. and having large-scale military mm -hmm. operations with all its partners. I mean, it, it certainly looks like containment. Yeah, well, I mean, it's very difficult to it's sort of like, you know, children's quarrel. Mm. You know, I didn't start, you started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, the military rivalry is always like that. Right. And you can't really pinpoint who exactly started it. Right. And, and between China and the U.S., that's happening to some extent. Right, right. You know, we think that Japan and U.S. are responding to the expanding China. But China think that uh, they were threatened first, therefore they need to catch up. Right. I mean, that's, it. that's why it's called security dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's true. China doesn't really have a whole lot of friends in the world. Mm -hmm. And every country that borders China has yeah. one kind of a dispute with it or yeah. another. Well, actually, Chinese have to think twice about that, mm. why that is the case. Right. That's a good point. Good point, good point. Um, Japan cut its defense budget by 1% this year. Mm -hmm. And yet this is a time when Japan perceives greater danger. Mm -hmm. North Korea, uh, we just said a second yeah. ago, growing Chinese military might. Yeah. Um, and yet at the same time, Japan talks about a new air force. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was talking about building six new submarines. I understand that plan has been put on hold. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what can we conclude? <laughs> <laughs> what can we conclude? <laughs> well, the Democratic Party of Japan has uh, spending priorities, mm. and right now its popularity is uh, dropping. <laughs> it, it's really desperate yeah. to you know, hold on to power. Mm. The defense spending has never been very popular. Mm. You know, people have more short-term views mm. about what's good for them, what they want. Right. And the Democratic Party tried to regain some popularity by enhancing its social uh, spending, yeah. welfare programs, right. and so forth. So uh, even, you know, having a conservative prime minister, Noda, mm -hmm. doesn't really change the overall spending mm. pattern of yeah. the Democratic Party's government. One suspects if it was left up to Noda alone, the defense expenditure would be larger. Yeah, I mean, if, if Noda can decide everything, yeah, yeah, most likely that will be the case. Well, let's uh, let's take a look at the uh, another contentious island issue between uh, Japan and a neighbor, and that is the Dokdo Takashima issue. Uh, here we have a very colorful brochure put together by the Korean government uh, on their uh, mm. uh, their view of the issue. It says on the back a rebuttal to the Japanese Foreign Ministry's 2008 brochure on Dokdo. Yeah. <laughs> and if you flip this and to show the other island, okay, the back, you can see the uh, the installations the Koreans built on top of the right, right. island. Uh, now, to just get us oriented here, uh, on this map, I think we can see it in the camera there. We have a red dot there, uh, an X. X marks the spot. This is the position of Takeshima Dokdo. Well, what can you tell us about? This contentious island issue. Yeah, well, do we go back to the history again? Yeah, that's about <laughs> what recap on history, just to let our audience know. <laughs> well, the Koreans think that historically the island belonged to Korea and they have some, uh, well, what they think, uh, supportive evidence. The difficulty with that part, you know, some Japanese agree with the Korean evidence, some Japanese dispute that, mm -hmm. and, uh, but, you know, there isn't much debate, really objective debate on that in Korea, because mm. history in regard to the Tokudo Island in Korea mm -hmm. has been heavily politicized, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, there is no freedom of speech on that. Mm. And 
the difficulty is uh, the island's name have been changed a couple of times, mm. and uh, which the island Korean refers name or the Japanese to name? the both. Both, okay. Yeah. Which island refers to which island mm -hmm. has been somewhat ambiguous, mm. and uh, the, the the island next to uh, Tokudo, mm. the the Urundo, uh -huh. uh, one name called with the same name Tokudo was called at some point really? in history and there's a lot of confusion in that so mm. you have to be careful with those historical documents mm. uh, of the Koreans mm. back then because there's a lot of uh, uh, confusion about the names <coughs> of the island. Are you suggesting they might have been doctored up a little bit? No, I think that uh, the naming has simply changed mm. over time, but exactly when it was changed, at what point which mm. island was called by this name, that name, those things are not very clear today. Mm. Yeah. So more historical research uh, would probably, uh, you know, make it clearer in that sense. The Japanese public, I, I don't know, there must have been some opinion polls done on this that you, that you probably saw. Uh, the Japanese public, what percentage says Takashima is Japanese, what percentage says it's Korean? It's almost 100%, almost unanimous. For Japan? For Japan. Okay. And how about on the Senkaku issue? Uh, Perhaps a little lower, but not by much. Not by much. Okay. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the national opinions very much united on both sides yeah. in Japan, in Korea, and in China also. It's very interesting as all these island issues are playing out. They they have the ability to raise or rise up a very high level of nationalism. Mm. Sure. There's a very important election about to unfold, or supposedly it says that the Prime Minister will announce a, uh, uh, an election in Japan. He would like to stay in power. Mm -hmm. He would like to keep his own power. In Korea, there's an election for the President coming up mm -hmm. in um, December. Right. China will have a leadership change. Typical Chinese things, we've got to wait till the last minute to know exactly when it's going to happen, but mm -hmm. probably late October, early November. Mm -hmm. um, if we factor in Taiwan, the leadership in Taiwan is very weak, very, very low uh, support rate. We have a lot of weak leaders dealing with a lot of sure. very complicated, contentious yeah. issues. Yeah, I mean, the weak leaders often use this kind of uh, uh, issue to show up right. support for right. the domestic regime. Right. And uh, the Korean president, Lee Min Bak's uh, visit to Takeshima mm. Tokudo was uh, clearly that case. Yeah. I was disappointed by him. I, I've, uh, um, I, I've appreciated President Im Myung Bak and yeah. his, what he's tried to do since his office, especially with U.S.-Korean yeah. relations. Um, but I, I, and his international demeanor. Yeah. But I didn't appreciate that, and I really didn't like the way he handled that potential intelligence agreement with uh, mm. Japan. I thought that could have been handled a little mm. bit more effectively. Mm. Um, and, yeah, but uh, the Koreans, for Koreans, this uh, Tokudo mm. is a historical issue. Yeah. You know, they think that the colonization of Korea started with Japan's claim to Tokudo, mm -hmm. and you know Japan, uh, I, Japan uh, uh, lodged its claim to uh, Senkaku. Um, excuse me, the Takeshima mm -hmm. in 1905, near the end of the war against Russia. That's the Korean view. No, no, Japanese. It's absolutely. Yeah, that's what Japanese did legally. It, was that based on the same notion by which they claimed the Senkakus? You know, no man's land. Yeah, same, same basis. Right. Okay. And uh, but five years later, you know, after uh, winning the war against Russia, five years later, Japan annexed Korea. Korea right. So, uh, from the Korean perspective, the colonization of Korea started not in 1910 but 1905. 
Mm. That's how they are, you know, learning about the Takeshima Tokudo mm. and uh, how they view the current dispute. I'll say something potentially controversial here. Yeah. Asian countries, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, certainly China, these sorts of sovereignty issues are great fodder for textbooks. Mm -hmm. They get manipulated around, they get twisted, they come out oftentimes with a very conservative point of view. It seems mm -hmm. in all, con all these countries. Mm -hmm. um, in Taiwan, the textbooks change every time there's a new president. Right? They want their own little pitch in there. <laughs> yeah. Textbook approval in Japan has been a controversial for yeah. e years and years and years. And yeah. I don't think certainly China is mm. not, not yeah. uh, innocent of this. And I, I suspect Korea, there's a lot of mm. playing with this type of issue. It's, yeah. it's hard to... Um, it's hard to clear people's minds up. You know, there was a very honest uh, interviewee on China's, Chinese TV saying, mm -hmm. well, you know, why are we acting like this, you know, about Japan? Because we've been taught that anything that comes up about Japan, we should act, mm -hmm. uh, uh, respond to in a very negative, forceful manner. Sure. It, it's it's it really hard to change. Mm. Well, I mean, as far as uh, China's concerned, China is an authoritarian country with no freedom of speech, right. and the history is clearly manipulated oh, there. Yeah. You you, know. By the party propaganda department, yeah. the Ministry of Education. Yeah. But South Korea you know, has democratized, right. and you know, it's, it's a, a society mm -hmm. is getting more used to democracy right. and you know after uh, you know some 70 almost 70 years since uh, you know Korea regained independence mm -hmm. the kind of anti Japanese uh, rhetoric mm. in general mm -hmm. are somewhat subsiding yeah. and the Korea doesn't always have to resort to anti-Japan to be united. I mean, it used, to be, <laughs> it used to be that was the case, right. but you know, Korea is gaining confidence right. and society is more maturing. Right. So uh, I'm more hopeful that more pluralistic historical views mm. will prevail in South Korea mm. in the coming years. Mm. And that will also apply to the historical discussion over Takeshima Tokudo. Mm. And I, you know, I want to see you know, some disagreements among the Koreans about mm. whose territory the Tokudo or Takeshima mm. is. Mm. Currently, it's very unanimous, yeah. and uh, I think it would almost be considered treasonous <laughs> to say they belong to Japan. Yeah, but in the end, I think objective history, mm. you know, will be pursued by independent scholars rather than by the state manipulation uh, of yeah. history education. Yeah. So, okay, so. The Japanese claim to Takashima is it has always been a Japanese island, period? Well, uh, Japan's claim is based on this 1905, the 1905. international okay. legal okay. claim. And the Korean claim is based on the notion, well, doctor... Kind of historical always, documents yeah. preceding 1905. This, well, there's some similarities with the Senkaku claims here, aren't there? Right, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, both South Korea and uh, China and Taiwan yeah. are basing their claims on kind of historical uh, right. records that they have. Dokdo does not have, um, well, I'm not sure about this, so I'm going to have to ask you. Are there any natural, there's some natural resources in the city of Dokdo. What about the fishing? Uh, well, some fishing is happening. But yeah, it's but not as rich as Senkaku's. Mm -hmm. The fish? Yeah, it's not uh, as... I, I'm sure it's a pretty good fishing ground. Pretty good fishing ground. But, uh, you know, the, the key difference is, I think, the Takeshima area, Tokudo area, there isn't not much talk about uh, mineral deposits. No, sure. Okay. Yeah. 
and, and we don't have standoffs between the Japanese Coast Guard and the Korean Coast Guard. And oh, the, the, there the, was a few years back. There was a few years ago? Yeah, okay. yeah. The, the Koreans were about to start uh, kind of research in uh, areas around uh, okay. the Tokudo, Takeshima. Okay. And the Japanese side protested. And, ah. and both sides sent Coast Guard patrol boats. And uh, yeah, they were doing, you know, <laughs> kind of <laughs> not the racing, but <laughs> mm. <laughs> show test of their will, <laughs> mm. <laughs> you might want to say. <laughs> mm. um, you know, I, I want to just, um, well, no, I don't want to do that after all. We have five and a half minutes left. Let's just do a quick, ch have a quick chat about the Kuril Islands, because that's the other yeah. island issue. Yeah. And for the benefit of audience, these are a group of four islands north of Hokkaido, uh, currently occupied by Russia, claimed by Japan. We hear there might be a compromise mm -hmm. uh, in the offing between Russia and Japan. Well, yeah, the a former diplomat who was engaged in this negotiation, uh, Mr. Togo, mm -hmm. uh, published a book recently, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, just recently. Yeah, it was uh, either 2012 or 2011. Oh, very recent. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it was in Japanese, so mm -hmm. uh, many. Uh, non-Japanese readers haven't seen it, mm -hmm. but uh, he claims that uh, there were six opportunities for Japan to, to, to get some of the islands back mm -hmm. from the Soviet Union mm -hmm. first and then Russia later. Mm. Six opportunities. Mm. And each time Japan couldn't successfully conclude the negotiation, mm. and uh, Japan was pretty much uh, insisting that all four islands must be returned mm. at once, mm. and uh, therefore agreement wasn't reached between mm. Japan and Soviet Union or <coughs> Russia uh -huh. later. And he argues that uh, the window of negotiation has not completely closed, mm. but any kind of gains Japan could draw from Russia mm. will be smaller than ever. Mm. So what does that mean? They, the, the Russians have for a long time said they would give back uh, Shikotan and Habomai, right? right? The two smallest of the four islands. Right, right. And I think it's Habomai is kind of a pile of rocks rather than an island. Yeah, very small islands. Um, the Shikotan's uh, inhabited by uh, people. Shikotan is, yeah. okay. And then there's Kunashiro and, Kunashiri et, and et, et, Etorofu. Etorofu. Yeah, those are bigger ones. Those are bigger. Yeah. Okay, so they, the Russians have been willing to get back the two smallest ones. Where might they go from there? Well, you know, the Russians has not backed back down from its, uh, the 1954 declaration mm -hmm. between the Soviet Union and Japan mm -hmm. that upon signing of a peace treaty between the two countries, mm -hmm. the Soviet Union was going to return. Habomai and Shikotan, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the, you know, for some time, you know, the Soviet Union, you know, during the Cold War, said, forget it, there's no territorial dispute as such, mm. they're all Russia's. Right. And, but, uh, you know, after the Cold War, the, you know, all Russian president have de said that the joint declaration is still valid. So. We're down to two minutes, by the way. At the bottom line, mm -hmm. Russia is committed to returning to islands. Could Japan settle for that? That is a question. I have a feeling that's difficult for them. So far, Japan has not said, OK, we'll just take two and forget the bigger two. Japan has not said that. But the atmosphere is changing, though, isn't it? We could get a minute and a half here just to get quickly squeeze this guy, this idea in. Japan wants to get off of nuclear power, therefore it needs more natural gas, more oil, yeah. of which Russia can uh, supply in abundance. Yeah, energy cooperation is of mutual benefit. Yeah. Russia needs Japanese capital for quantity and for diversifying the sources of right. capital. And 
Russia and Japan also share interest in、uh, strategically being careful about、China. its big neighbor, China.、Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, you've given us a lot to think about again. A very insightful and a very encyclopedic knowledge. And、uh, thank you very much for stopping by. Thank you very much. You're welcome.